The Zooier Than Thou podcast contains adult concepts and language and is intended for a mature audience. So if your tattoos wash off in the shower, come back when you're a little older. Welcome, one and all. Thank you for sharing in three years of zoo positivity. It's time, once again, for Zooier Than Thou. Can I say, you got me howling at the moon. Whoa, don't you know, the love is wild when you're a zoo. With zoo, we are Greetings, fellow zoos, and welcome to the final episode of Zooier Than Thou Season 3. I'm Toggle, your polyamorous podcasting papa. And I'm Steve, your stunning sticker stud. And we'll be your hosts this evening. Well, Togs, this officially marks the end of three full years of Zooier Than Thou. And it's definitely been a hell of a year. We came out swinging with some pretty big topics every month. Religion, abuse, the gay rights movement, coming out, animal rights, veganism, shit hitting the fan, and a heaping bowl of upset to wash it all down. So we decided this month we'd give you a little breather before season four and keep it simple, in part because we have a bunch of emails to go through. But also in part to give our listeners the opportunity to help us decide what, if anything, should change in season four. We want to know what you like, what you hate, what you tune in to hear, and what you fast forward through. To that end, we've got a podcasting survey we'd really like everyone to participate in. This survey can be found in the show notes for this episode on the website and on YouTube, but also on our Twitter, at Zooier Than Thou. Rest assured, though it asks some questions about demographics, we only see aggregated data and will not be able to tell who's who. It's completely anonymous. However, we do get to see your comments, and we've got some interesting feedback so far. The tough part, of course, is that some of you love what others of you hate, so we're trying to get an idea of overall trends to help us decide how to proceed in the future. It may be that very little changes. Or we could decide on a completely different format. And it's going to be heavily influenced by what you have to say about the show. We are particularly interested in thoughts on seasons two and three. We recognize by some answers there are a few folks who haven't tuned in since season one. And while we absolutely appreciate their feedback because we'd like to know what might make them tune in, comments about Fausti's rambling aren't quite relevant to how the show presents itself now. Aw, I love a good Fausti diatribe. Ah, uh, don't worry. There was a lot of Fausti love in there, too. Everyone has different tastes, but we hope we can improve the show in a way that everyone can appreciate. It's good to change things up now and then, which is something I keep trying to tell my autistic brain when I'm used to a routine. One side note, you can feel free to ignore the questions at the end about what podcasts you listen to. Oh yeah, that's that's one of those things the survey people want to know, but you can leave it blank if you want. Also, the questions about your work and income, while interesting data points, aren't designed for us because we don't do advertising. You mean to tell me all those sponsors after the emails are fake? Yeah, even when they're real, they aren't paid endorsements. Our funds come from people donating at donate.zoo.wtf, and we are incredibly grateful for those people who keep the lights on. Again, you can find that survey on our website in the show notes for this episode, in the YouTube description for the episode, and on our Twitter account, at Zooier Than Thou. Well, that's enough ado about nothing. Let's hop into emails. Give us a good one, Steve. Alrighty. Our first one is from Ty, who has two questions. Ty writes, so I got two questions for everyone on the show. You don't say. One, how did you find out you were a zoophile? And two, how did y'all find each other? Oh, well, uh, I'll answer the second one first. We found each other through this podcast. Most of the people who work on the show now were people who emailed in and got involved in one way or another. The original crew, I don't really want to get into personal details, but they were people me and Fausti already knew and brought together when we decided to put together a podcast. They prefer to remain anonymous, so that is how they will remain. So how did you and Fausti meet? Well, we talked about this on the podcast at the end of season one, I think. I DM'd him on my old Twitter account and told him I thought some of his cross-species alliance posts were petulant, and he agreed that petulant was a very appropriate word. And then we just started talking in DMs until I finally got him to stop bitching about Telegram long enough to join it. Yeah. So remind me, how did you specifically join the podcast? 
Okay, so some of our mutual acquaintances knew about the podcast and thought that I should listen to it. So I checked it out and agreed. And I submitted my first entry on the, I believe it was like a Zoo Pride reminiscence kind of thing. I wrote in there and then became acquainted with Fausti. We started corresponding and then we just kind of took it from there. Nice. Yep. So people listened in and then they messaged us and somehow magically started recording on the podcast. (laughs) All right. I've talked about how I found out I was a zoo, but I don't remember if you have. How did you figure it out? Oh, my earliest memories ever from when I was, oh, I don't know, maybe four or five years old (laughs) were being attracted to animals. I knew right away. Oh, wow. Right. And then it A little bit later, I figured out that that was a little different than a lot of other people. And yeah, I guess I was an early bloomer. My first (laughs) experiences were maybe around 10 years old. Oh, wow. And I view them very positively. Yeah, it's been a whole life. Yeah, wow. I didn't even know until I was like 13, but I guess it's about the right time to figure that kind of thing out. (laughs) Most of the rest of the crew has talked about how they realized they were zoo and generally... If you find the first time they came on the podcast, they likely talked about it in that instance. Yep. Thanks for writing in, Ty. We hope you've enjoyed the show so far. Next, here's one from Yarek, who says Zoo has helped him and he wants to give back. Yarek writes, Hey, I just wanted to send in a piece of fan mail to help with my own peace of mind. I have only really just been dipping into the Zoo community recently, and Zoot has helped with it. I'm still not too sure what I'm doing here or where I'm going with it all currently, but it's something I know has always been close to me. Animals have always been better companions than people. I always attributed them with love and being at home in my heart and feel like Zoo is a step in the right direction. Recently, I lost contact with a companion I was extremely close to because of a rough breakup and my ex-partner literally pulling the dog from my arms. This really helped me realize how zooey I am. I struggle to come out about it because of the fear of people I care about turning on me, and hell, some might even find out by me sending in this email, but I still want to do something notable and big for the zoo community for how some of them have helped me, like the zoo podcast, to give back to all of you. I'm grateful the community is accepting of me, and that there are others out there like me, and zoos making a difference. If anyone needs a hand with a zoo project, Let me know. I'm a jack of all trades and I have a passion for editing and have a little experience in YouTube video work. Maybe another time I will open up about myself and share more detailed life stories to those around me. Have a beautiful day to all the zoos out there and stay safe. You are all loved. Oh man, that's nice to hear. Thanks for writing in. Yeah, absolutely. So I can tell you there's no shortage of need for talented people to do things. Yes. So if you do YouTube video editing, I know of a project that would love to have that kind of a thing going on. So we'll definitely put you to work if you want to be put to work. You just reach out. I know this This sounds like some feel good, blow sunshine up your butthole kind of talk, but uh, just the fact that you're alive and thriving and a zoo is pretty special and there's a lot to be thankful for there and we're thankful that you're around even though you're having your struggles here and there the fact that you're just waking up every day and being a zoo and reaching out is pretty cool i'm sorry to hear about your breakup i think that is probably not an uncommon scenario to have a lot of love for an animal and then lose them in a human relationship issue true don't have great advice about that, unfortunately, but it's interesting that that was the point that you realized you were a zoo. So it wasn't even anything that was sexual or anything like that that sparked it. It was just realizing how, how much you really love that dog. Yeah, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Well, thanks for writing in, Yarek, and thanks for offering your skills to the community. These next two we want to address together because they share a similar sentiment. First, a raven in the meadow is doubting herself and hoping for some tips. Raven writes, These past few months, with more and more zoos coming out, especially with the recent drama, a new flood of hate has come our way. Usually I'd be able to ignore it since most of the hate is generic and unoriginal, kill yourself or you're disgusting, but recently the hate has been getting worse and I've been questioning if animals really can consent. If I'm actually a zoophile, am I disgusting after all? 
I had my first interaction when I was a young child. I got strong urges and often had sexual fantasies with animals. So when I found out about the zoosexual zoophile community, I immediately started to doubt my attraction. Because zoophilia is often frowned upon, I kept doubting myself and kept saying, no, 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 you're not a zoosexual. It went like that for weeks until I couldn't take it anymore and finally considered myself a zoosexual. But with all of this new wave of drama and hate, I find it often gaslight myself. Have any tips on this? I know there is a lot of zoos who are currently questioning their sanity, beliefs, sexuality, and animals' ability to consent. I know most people say just ignore it, but it's hard when you know everyone you meet are probably antis, and if you join some sort of public space like Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc., you're going to be flooded with hate. It's really hard. Could you provide any tips on this for people struggling out there? Second, Jane Doe's subject line just reads, help. Jane writes, I am a zoophile. That is my first time saying it. I've tried for years to push shit down and a lot of my friends are staunch aunties slash bigots. I don't know if how I'm supposed to cope when the people who say they love me wish for my death. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do, but it hurts. So these are slightly different, but there's a similar sentiment being shared here. Yeah, shame, death threats, and hatred. I want to start by saying that there is no reason to join Twitter and publicly announce you're a zoophile if you're not interested in specifically doing some kind of public-facing activism. In fact, even though we talk about it a lot, I don't recommend being on Twitter at all if you can help it. Twitter is built for angry mobs, and it needs people to be in conflict to stay afloat. You don't have to subject yourself to death threats and harassment to be a part of the zoo community. If you want somewhere supportive, try zoocommunity.org or try some Telegram chats, but make sure they have that double shield in the name so you know they don't tolerate abuse. Right. It's it's sad that we lost Louis Anderson recently, the comedian, but he said something mm-hmm. that has stuck with me in a documentary of all things. He said that um, mm-hmm. in response to hecklers and haters and critics, resentment is the only thing that eats its own container. So, oh, wow. So if somebody's going out of the way to expend energy to try to harm you, just know that they're saying way more about themselves than they are about you. And the best, healthiest response to somebody who's lashing out like that is to prevent them from being able to reach you. Just block them. Remove yourself from the space. What, Absolutely. What good does it do? to interact with those people. They have their own issues and don't make them your issues. Right. I've always said that when people say kill yourself or I hope you die, that is a move of desperation, uh, a feeling of powerlessness because they have no other way to stop you from doing whatever you're doing, but to make you feel less and harassed. Right. I would say also, don't doubt that animals can consent. I think the better thing you should do is don't assume that an animal is consenting. It's pretty cut and dried. Animals have a way to express assent and dissent. We can tell that they want us to do things and don't want us to do things. There's books about behavior, like we know how to do this. But the actual thing that zoos should keep in mind is in this moment, does this dog consent to what's happening right now? And it Even in situations that aren't sexual, thinking about how is that dog feeling about me being here or about whatever activity we're doing, just don't get too overconfident. But it's not a matter of whether they can consent. It's if they are consenting that you should think about. Well, and and to that, I would add, it's a bad faith argument in the first place. They don't really want to engage with you. They just want to heap abuse on you. So there's a false equivalency there. They're saying... If an animal can't send you an engraved invitation expressing their (laughs) consent in the highest queen's English, then it doesn't count (laughs) when they wouldn't hold another human being to that standard. Here's the thing. Animals certainly can consent in the way that they consent with other animals. Obviously, animals can consent and do in their own way. If we are sensitive enough to our partner's needs, then we are able to discern whether our partner is okay with what we're doing. Right. The other thing I want to mention is that the loudest anti-zoo actors are actually a minority. They're just really loud. 
They really need you to believe that everyone hates you. Like, that's important to their game plan. Most people are ambivalent, and you won't hear from those people because they're ambivalent. Right. They don't give a shit. They don't have an opinion on it. They're not going to tell you their opinion on it. They're just going to go with whatever the flow is at the time. Anti-zoos need you to believe that everyone hates you. Right. And you, you find this out right away if you come out to everyone you know in real life. <laughs> because... But of course, right. be careful yeah. about that. Listen to our episode on yeah, coming out. Say, really weigh that I'm not decision. I'm do that, but I'm saying that if you do that, you'll probably find a couple of people on the low end of the bell curve that freak the fuck out and hate you. You'll find a couple of people on the high end of the bell curve that are zoos. And most of the people are somewhere in the middle where they super don't care either way. It does not affect them <laughs> at all. Right. You know, but as you indicated, you're not going to hear from those people. Right. And also, you, you mentioned, like, am I even a real zoophile? It's totally okay to question if you're a zoophile or not. Just don't deny it simply because you, you think people hate it. If it's there, suppressing it is bad for your mental health. And frankly, the people that you're concerned about are that were mentioned, you said friends in quotes. So obviously you can recognize that there's something off about those relationships where you put friends in quotation marks. Yeah, that's a really valid point. The other thing I'd add to this is just think about if you played a drinking game where you took a shot every time an anti-gay conservative politician was revealed ultimately to be super duper gay as oh evidenced gosh. by all of their rampant gayness, right? You would you would die. You would go blind. <laughs> you, would, you would collapse into a coma and you'd never wake up again if you drink every time that happened. It's happened too many times to mention. So think about this. If there's people going out of their way to dunk on zoos, what are the chances that that person is a self-hating zoo who can't deal with their own stuff? I'm going to tell you that the chances are high and we know this because we've had conversations with people in those anti-zoophile chats. If you get into private conversations with a lot of them, they reveal a lot. And a lot of it is repression and self-hatred, self-loathing, because they know that they have this attraction and they have bought into the idea that whatever they are is wrong. So when you do see anti-zoos, you might even just pity them, because a lot of times that is exactly the scenario. Yeah, so just putting this out there as a public safety announcement, Zoo Than Now does not recommend playing drinking games based on repressed sexuality people actually having the sexuality that they're <laughs> that they're dunking on. So yeah, don't don't die. It's not worth it. Definitely not. <laughs> so hopefully that perspective helps a little bit, Jane and Raven. Stay defiant and stay proud. Surround yourself with love. And always put an animal's needs first in your interactions with them, and you'll have a hard time going wrong. Our next email is from a wireless coyote who's looking for relationship advice for a befuddled zoo. Wireless writes, Hello, I discovered the podcast through the link on Zooville and have been listening daily to catch up ever since. I want to start by expressing my sadness at the loss of Fausti. It hurt my heart to listen to the episodes that he was in because I had such a backlog of content that I knew by the time I caught up to the most recent show, he would most likely have passed. Whether or not he would have agreed, he was a great man and a boon to the community. It was lost what we felt for a long time. Couldn't agree more. I found my first entry to the community through Beast Form, like many others my age. Yikes, I know. But was more of a lurker than anything else and didn't run across a lot of the bad stuff that was going on. I've known that I was a zoo since I was about 12, but being born into a very traditional Protestant family and a devout Christian myself, I fought an internal struggle with myself for the next 10 years. I was heartened to hear Toggle's background and know that he had gone through the same thing, my condolences, and mm. glad that we both made it through. I didn't totally come to terms with my sexuality until about six months ago. When I finally started to question a lot of the, quote, fundamental beliefs of the modern Christian churches. Specifically, I started to sort out what was actually doctrine specifically supported in the Bible as commands for the New Covenant Christians and what was either tradition or confused leftovers from old law. The Zoophilia and Religion episode really hit home for obvious reasons, as Wolf restated almost everything that I had found for myself. 
My past aside, and I would be happy to talk more, though I doubt anyone would be terribly interested. Don't say that. I have a lingering (laughs) problem from my old, long-fought struggle with my sexuality. A few years ago, I got married to a human woman whom I absolutely love, the only human woman I have ever been attracted to. We were friends from college, and I told her before we even had our first date that I was a zoo, and I had zoo experiences in the past, and after more explanation of zoophilia and some hesitation on her part, she kind of got over it with the caveat that I not do it anymore. Ooh. Which seemed fine to me as I was trying to hurt my sexuality in the first place. But fast forward to a few years later, and I finally justified my sexuality through personal Bible study, and I brought it up to her again that... Now that I had finally accepted myself for who I am and was convinced that it wasn't a sin, I wanted to pursue these sexual desires I had been loath to follow through with all my life. And her answer, after a lot of discussion and reasoning and trying to compromise, was a resounding no. I don't know what else to do. She said maybe we could discuss it again in a few years, but I don't want to wait that long. Though I will if I have no other choice. Am I just being selfish? I have no idea what to do and any advice would be appreciated. No. Yeah. Let me just start by saying <laughs> that's a really tough situation. I have seen a lot of folks have relationship problems with their human partners after finally coming to terms with being a zoo after being married. Like, I've seen this happen. Uh, I can think of two right now. And I don't know. I don't think it's entirely dissimilar to men who come to terms with homosexuality after being in a committed relationship and starting a family and, you know, suddenly they're 45 and they realize I have been gay my entire (laughs) life and now I want to pursue that. And that's a sore point for (laughs) people who have a wife. You know, I, I think it's a little selfish, but sometimes you need to acknowledge your own needs, right? Well, yeah, you you should always do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's something at the very end that was like the red flaggiest of red flags and it's causing mm-hmm. me the most concern it says i will wait that long if i have no other choice dude the only thing you have to do is eventually die <laughs> 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 everything oh, else is optional my man and richard Bach says that if you argue for your limitations, then sure enough, they're yours. But truly, this you have literally infinite other directions in space that you can go, my man. You can be by yourself. You could be with a whole menagerie of humans and or non-humans. There's a zillion ways to go, my dude. This, there's literally seven billion human beings on the planet right now. <laughs> you don't have to be with the one that condemns you for your sexuality. Right? But it's also the one human he's met that he's actually attracted well, to. Has he So there's some value in has that. Has he tried dating the other six point nine 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 billion humans? I don't know, man. I'm just saying, like it's it's pretty destructive when someone's rejecting you for something so intrinsic and intimately you that you can't change and wouldn't want to if you could. So here's the thing though, like all relationships require some kind of compromise. Sure. And actually, frankly, I'm glad that you were able to have this kind of discussion with your wife at all. It sounds like you actually have a healthy line of communication if you can have this kind of conversation because a lot of people in a similar situation would not. Yeah, that's true. That's worth having. So to be fair, you kind of sprung this on her after agreeing that you would not have sex with animals at the beginning of the relationship. So you set a boundary and now things have changed. So, I mean, and things do change and you revisit those boundaries and that's valid. But, you know, this may be something that requires time for her to process as this is something that you kind of mentioned once uh, and explained once and then waved away and it has been a thing for years and then suddenly here it is. Let's imagine you were finding out that you were gay and you came to your wife and said, I like dudes, I want to sleep with dudes. You know, that might be a problem for the boundaries you've set for that relationship. You want to sleep with other people, but also still be my husband. I don't know about that because that's that's not what we agreed on. Yeah, some relationships will survive that. And you see very non-conventional blended families that work just fine. And some of them, people feel like uh, they should probably get a fresh start. So in the end, you got to decide what's more important. A relationship with the only human woman you've ever loved or the free pursuit of your sexuality. 
And if the answer sounds obvious to anyone, it's really not. I can't answer that for you. But if this is going to put a wedge in your relationship, you need to weigh those options very carefully and don't make any rash decisions. Patience is a virtue in this situation. If you do want to explore this with your wife, educating her on your sexuality and, and things like that might be worth having those kinds of discussions. But ultimately, you have to decide what's most important to you. Yeah, that's a tough one, my less coyote. But I hope you're able to come to a decision you're at peace with in the end. We've got some more emails coming up right after this word from all those sponsors who don't actually sponsor us. Stick around for more Zooier Than Thou. This episode is brought to you by Herder. Now available on iPhone and Android. Herder. For when you're horny and you need to get rammed. And by My Life with the Humans by Dr. Jane Gooddog. Dr. Gooddog manages to demystify the perplexing nature of human behavior through her honest narrative of a lifetime immersed in the world of her two-legged companions. And finally, by you, taking the time to listen tonight, tuning in each month no matter how long the episode is. There would be no Zoot without each and every one of you. Thanks for listening. Um, hi there. My name is Randy the Ram. Um, I reached out to the producers of this uh, podcast here, and they're letting me do, um, so, okay. Personal ads in the newspapers are so old-fashioned, and I didn't know enough about Craigslist to put in... The thing is, my hooves make it really hard to swipe right on Tinder... So this is my attempt at, um, dating personal ad, but, um, they wrote it for a, a grinder or a Howler account. Are you sure you're okay with this script? Mm, how would you like to be rammed by a real ram? No need to be sheepish. My name is Randy, and I'm here to fuck. Looking for bottoms only. This Ovis only tops, but I'm bisexual, looking for anybody who wants either hole rammed. Think you're as horny as a bigorn? Think you're ready for all five inches? Then give me a call at 555-1324. Horses may leave you horse. And dogs may leave you panting, but this ram will make sure to leave you counting sheep afterwards. <clears throat> so sorry, it comes across better in text. So, uh, you know, give me a call. This is Zooier Than Thou, a podcast for zoophiles and our friends, with new episodes every month on the full moon. To subscribe... Point your favorite podcast client at rss.zoo.wtf, and for even more content, check out bonus.zoo.wtf. Thanks for listening. Welcome back, fellow zoos. Hey. 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 Okay, so I'm pretty sure we get these kinds of DMs, right? Or is it just me? Oh, just like, hey, and nothing else? Oh, my God. Okay. So there's this phenomenon and there's even groups about it, tag groups where women will post screenshots and it's called things like men talking to themselves in my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought it was just for them until it happened to me. And wow. I, I started getting these really weird emails and it's not just one person. So please, sir, don't feel that I'm singling you out specifically it's all weirdos like you um oh my god <laughs> you can't say that <laughs> and i get it you want to participate you want to reach out to other zoos and i'm a zoo and you're excited and i'm excited that you're excited this is great however if you're just typing hey over and over and over it starts to feel like i'm being stalked by a michael myers so, oh my god. So it's a little weird, right? Oh yeah, it's a little weird. Here's some advice for everyone. And I'm sure we've said it before, but 
If you're going to approach someone and you want to talk to them and they are a stranger who you know through some, say, medium, say hi and then tell them why you're reaching out. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you can do that in the first message. Hi, I really like your podcast and I just wanted to let you know that. You know, that's fine. Right. It's usually yeah. it's usually that. Or it's a little more salacious and someone says, hi, send me pictures of you having sex with animals. That's oh my God. It's never going to go well. I'm prepared for those. Or rarely it'll be someone who says, hey, I like what you did with the podcast. Thanks for supporting the community. That's pretty cool. But there's a fourth option for which I was not prepared, which is someone just saying, hey, over and over and over. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, are you going to tell me to kill myself or send you porn or like, it, does something come after this? It's like an endless, hey. it's like that knock knock joke where it's always a banana. It's like, <laughs> please let the orange come. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered we got a message like a year or two ago from someone. Someone had messaged them and told them that their Twitter was ours on Omegle. <laughs> okay. And this poor man from India messaged us. is like, hey, how you doing? You want to continue what we started? And it was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. So we were kind of like, yeah, that's that's not us. Thank you. Oh, my God. He was like, oh, okay. And then like a year later, he messaged like, hey, you remember me? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're the guy who thought we messaged you on Omegle. He was like, you don't have to pretend. I know it's you. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know what you did. <laughs> you know what you did. It wasn't us. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> it wasn't me. We're just we're just the animal sex guys. <laughs> we had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I don't use Omegle. Uh, what do you think I am? Some, some kind, kind of, of pervert. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Oh my god. We run a family show here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. Dude, if we were getting weirded out, you've it, things got pretty weird. Really so weird. Yeah. <laughs> but we like most of the emails and stuff we get though, like obviously. We've enjoyed getting all these other emails where people write in and ask questions or share their stories. And please continue doing that. Yes. So it's been a long time since we've had the chance to do this. And one of my favorite things is getting to hear the outtakes from my favorite shows. So I wanted to share a few of the ones I've collected over the years. To start us off, here's a few bloopers going all the way back to season one. Yay, bloopers. I also agree that women are vastly unre... Mm. I also agree that women are vastly underrepresented in Zooey Media. Man. <laughs> I also agree that women are vastly underrepresented in... Oh my god. But if you do feel condoms are necessary, more lube is necessitated... Necessitated is... Necess... <laughs> What's that word? Necessitated. More lube is... <laughs> I should have known that. <laughs> more... <laughs> Reading is not one of my Necessitated. <laughs> Just kidding. I can read. <laughs> More lube is necessitated as well. Join us next episode as we talk about a subject near and dear to my heart. Veganism. Vaginaism. Vaginaism. <laughs> it's bound to be more delicious than you thought, so don't miss it. <laughs> it's okay. We don't there, have any how questions. about there was a, a question in Go reverse ahead. for... I asked him uh, what the numbers dad, were. Dad, 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 you, you, you gotta use my pseudonym. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you've done so well. Love cat. <laughs> Love cat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, technical difficulties on this end here. No problem. Okay, it turns out that I was an idiot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the technical problem was that I'm dumb. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh. ASMR Twilight Zone. There was a time when the beard. Sorry. No, no, we shan't do that. Ago, I heard that Fausti's gone, and it broke mm. my heart. 
My eyes keep pissing tears from <laughs> Come on, dude, I can't say that. <laughs> Horrible. But oh, I no. feel like I can't just take it upon myself to say something else because it's what he wrote. Yeah. I'll just say pouring, okay? That's ah, fair. Do that. Okay. Because <laughs> it kind of takes away from the meaning of the email. <laughs> and we're just focusing on pissing tears. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, hold on. Oh. <laughs> Occasionally, we'll take breaks while recording and just have conversation. Here's a couple of edited clips from some of those conversations. Like, getting from here to here is really hard. That was good. You know, I found this video of this guy who does a perfect Casey Kasem impression, but he fucking sucks at explaining it. He's like, he's like, find your Shaggy Rogers voice. I'm like, okay, asshole. It's like, fucker, I came here. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so it starts out, she's like, find your raspy voice. My raspy voice sits right here where it sounds like I'm Shaggy. And like, what does the <laughs> raspy voice mean? And then he's like, do this, it's called like a catch and release technique. He's like, I created this technique and it goes like this. And then the step three is to combine the two of them. I'm like, <laughs> you've explained nothing. Draw two circles, do some finished work, now you have an owl. <laughs> I hate exactly. that shit. Add details. Add details. Add details, yeah. Like, but his Casey Kasem is pretty impressive, man. That was good. Yeah, I thought that was good, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So the, the baby fur stuff is back on my Twitter. Oh, Why? Right. Yeah. I don't know. It was gone for, like, a couple months. And last night, it came back with a vengeance. Oh, my God. A vengeance. Uh... Yeah. It almost feels deliberate. Like there's somebody in charge of the things that they want me to be interested in. They're like, okay, sports, uh, send them something with diapers. Um, <laughs> cartoons, definitely more diapers. <laughs> Video games, we got any ones with diapers? <laughs> yes, diapers. <laughs> oh, it just, it just would not stop. <laughs> Why? And for the record, I don't mind diapers. Who are you following? It's oh, gotta be. Fun. It's gotta be rubber asylum. It's gotta. Oh be. my god, he doesn't even talk about diapers on his main. No, he's too busy talking about us. Yeah, but uh, there's a whole bunch of people <laughs> linked to him that uh, talk, that talked about diapers. Guilty by association. <laughs> you were three degrees s separated. None from of this is ever getting published. Oh, I wouldn't be uh, so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> I. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, go get a little BBC going on in there. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, dry as toast. Yeah, we we could get the CBC PSA music actually. And the good news <laughs> is that this CBC is never going to sue you. They're just going to write you a nasty note and express their Excuse strongest me. displeasure. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, so. The zoo podcast. Yeah. We, uh, we, respect, we respectfully request that you not use our copyrighted material in the future. That we are sure this was a misunderstanding that you did so initially. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, whatever. Shredder. We're, we're sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, we're sorry to bother you, but you <laughs> used the copyrighted material in a Zoom podcast, and that's a little awkward. Which we, we would prefer not to acknowledge that you exist. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And, and in actually writing you this letter, you have made us sweat and feel awkward because we are actually writing to. And the Prime Minister himself had to sign off on this because, you know, awkward. <laughs> Using CBC materials would always make me chuckle, but that would probably only a very small segment of the audience would have any idea what the fuck these particular <laughs> themes were. Finally, it wouldn't be a proper outtake section without some clips of Fausty making my life difficult. <laughs> can change that. I... Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> T tell me when to go. Uh, we, when I, this is okay. relatively free flowing, so it's it's all good. Free like especially okay, okay. if you talk over top of toggle and stuff, you get bonus points for that. So oh, feel okay. free to. Oh my god! Yeah. yeah. <sighs> <sighs> Anxiety. Om, okay. Money Padme Om. And uh, I think it's fair to say, on behalf of Toggle and myself, and the extraordinary team of people that now help to make this podcast happen every two weeks that we have founded and grown this project based on exactly the principle that she has articulated so well here. Okay. Uh, you know, someone has to go back and fix this transcript. 
Yeah. <laughs> Who's the photo that keeps going off the transcript and randomly talking about shit? Jesus. What a mess. What a goddamn mess. All right, go ahead, V. <clears throat> This is a uh, long-running thing between Toggle and IV. You can just ignore us. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. It, it, it yeah. leaks out from time to time in the podcast. Yeah. It's, wonder, it's wonderful. A bit. <laughs> Before, oh, got it some... immediately. Excellent. Okay, so... Oh, this is... Uh... No, this is the one I sent to buttholes at zoo.wgf, so that came through. <laughs> at least we know that one works. Thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got our priorities right. <laughs> How many of these things do you have? Oh, I have a butt-ton. But I didn't want to take more than 10 minutes of the episode to laugh at our shenanigans. So if this is the kind of thing you enjoy, let me know. And maybe I'll release some of the full conversations as bonus content. Maybe a suggestion for season four in our survey. Let us know. All right, then. We've got some more emails to do, so let's get to it. Here's one from Flora, who wants to support her girlfriend. Flora writes, My girlfriend and I have been a lesbian couple for two years. Recently, she came out as zoosexual and has been telling me she wants to be Polly and wants us to get a mate. How do I support her? Okay, so what you're telling me is that your girlfriend loves both flora and fauna. Oh, dude, there's a special place in hell for us. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever, that's a good one. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so like, first of all, Your cool girlfriend, allowing her to have a zoosexual outlet in the first place is really cool. Yeah. I would say you're talking about being in a polyamorous relationship with an animal. Are you a zoo? Like, is this something that you're interested in doing? I do worry a little bit about that. I don't think you should feel pressured to, for instance, have sex with animals if that's not something you want to do. Right. And just because humans having bad, cliched, polyamorous human relationships... In a certain way, just because they're doing that doesn't mean that you have to replicate that pattern with your animal partner. Your animal mate for your girlfriend doesn't have to be a unicorn that you both are active with. It's okay. If, If she's the only person interested in this animal, then you don't have to do that too, just because she's doing it. Right. So like for me, my husband is into BDSM, hardcore. I want nothing to do with that. So that's not something that I fulfill in his sex life. He goes and finds other people who want him to beat them up. And that's fine with me. Yeah, that's that's okay. That's his outlet. And I don't mind. It doesn't make me jealous. It's fine. So that's a valid way to to take care of the situation. It's just be like, okay, well, you're into animals. That's your thing. We don't have to share that. But when you're ready, you can come back and hang out with me in, in the bed. And we'll share that. Because I can fulfill those other needs for you. Well, and something really cool that you can do that doesn't involve you crossing any of your own boundaries necessarily is just being a supportive, badass partner who learns as much as you can about this Mm -hmm. aspect of her sexuality. She's still the same girlfriend that you love. You just know a little bit more about her now. Yeah, absolutely. So learn more. Make her feel open sharing it. Another thing you can do is when you hear someone making negative comments about zoos, tell them it's not cool. You won't often hear that if you're not in the furry community, but if you are, you know, you can just be like, listen, I know some people who are zoos, what you think is not the the reality of it. And that's something that really helps make someone feel supported. One last thing, remember, in this interaction, animals are another person. They're not a toy to spice up your sex life. So just keep that in mind. When you are bringing an animal into your lives, they might not want to have sex. And you got to remember that they are a person who doesn't want to have sex, not something for you to get off with. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so keep that in mind. But otherwise, rock on. Yeah. Best of luck with the fauna, Flora. Thanks for being willing to support your girlfriend. Here's a letter from Nodding Novice, who has a myriad of inquiries. The Novice writes, Hi, I enjoy this podcast more than I can really say, though I've only listened to most of the first season or so, since each episode is about two hours long. Sorry. Three and a half. (laughs) (laughs) I instantly resonated with several traits of the host and thus gained more of a sense of belonging than before, despite being a lurker. However, I do have a few questions. Firstly, despite my being almost entirely homosexual, 
I do have to ask, do female dogs have any desire or pleasure for intercourse outside of heat? And an unrelated question, and I do not mean that sarcastically, what breeds of canines are decently sized? You know, their whole body, I mean. Friendly and indoor. And a follow-up to that. Know any within that category that have smaller knots but normal shafts? Proportionally, the knot would be small, I mean. I'm kind of scared that knots might hurt, given the size I've heard they can get to. And of course, since you have more knowledge on the composition of the community than I, do zoos teach newcomers how to communicate with various animals? I was going to post that as part of my meetup offer on Zooville, once the conditions are right, but it'd be nice to get some insight. Cheers to you, and gratuitous gratitude for your work. Nodding novice. Okay, question one. Do female dogs have any desire or pleasure for intercourse outside of heat? It, it depends on the individual. I've known at least two partners who it, the heat didn't matter at all. They were receptive no matter what. I've known other zoos who have told me that their partner is only receptive during heat and other zoos still who say their partner isn't receptive no matter what. So it really varies on the individual and you just have to go with whatever your partner is comfortable with. So as far as size, to Decently answer that question, I would need to know your size <laughs> <laughs> and some other stuff too. If you're trying to find one that fits within your body, we would need to know things like, well, how much can you fit in your body? Because <laughs> yeah, there's people for whom a single pinky finger with lots of lube and patience and time might hurt you really badly. And there's other people that could fit Clydesdale's flare inside their body and barely even flinch so <laughs> well i think part of that okay so you mm -hmm. should probably warm up before taking a knot if you can or at least take time to get used to not size things being in your butt yes. your butt is a powerful muscle and it can stretch and do miraculous things but it can't do them on a dime you have to tell them hey this is a muscle i need to work out it needs to get used to this kind of thing happening. Let me work on this for some time. Sure. And there's lots and lots of toys made by lots and lots of different kinds of people, some of which we would definitely recommend. And they even have similar anatomy on these toys to the partners that you might likely encounter. So if you can right. take one of those toys, there's a better chance that maybe you could accept your canine partner. So again, what breeds of canine are decently sized, friendly, and indoor? A lot of things go into that, that factor in how big is your home? How big are you? How active um, is this dog? How high energy are they? It, higher energy would be more like, oh, say like a husky, <laughs> where they will high maintenance, tear yeah. your home down if you don't entertain them. And lower maintenance and lower energy would be something like an English bulldog. And that's a huge dog. A male bulldog could be like, you know, over 100 pounds and yet perfectly wow. suitable for a tiny efficiency apartment because they just don't really think of anything to get up to often. And that could vary right. individual to individual. You could have a typically very high energy animal like a Doberman Pinscher that happens to be super chill, that particular one. See, it's hard to generalize this. I would say if you're an average size human, probably an average size animal companion that would be compatible with your anatomy, male or female, would be 60 pounds and up. Now, if you start getting into, you know, a 150 pound male Great Dane or something, then you're getting into like anal wrecking ball territory. <laughs> so <laughs> just know what you're getting Some into, man. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's good. So if you find dogs that are about that size, Huskies, German Shepherds, etc., I think it's probably the kind of dog you're looking for, but I kind of recommend maybe looking for a mutt because those purebred breeds can indeed have a lot of health problems, and that is a tragedy waiting to happen yes. over time. Also, you're bringing some, someone else into your life. I, I say this every time because I just want to make sure it's clear. You don't get to date a canine before you bring them into your lives. There's a chance that canine might just not be into you, but you still have a responsibility to take care of them after the fact. Don't dump your partner because you're not sexually compatible. That's super uncool. Don't do it. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad scene. Don't do it. Now, 
My understanding is zoos in the old guard would pass down their knowledge, and there's kind of a ritual type of thing where you you go and you stay with them, they teach you things, etc. I don't know that anyone does that right now. I haven't seen it since in-person zoo gatherings back in the mid to late 90s. Yeah. However, now a lot of people will pass on knowledge informally, so you pick up things from talking to different people who have different experiences, so meeting a lot of people is helpful. In terms of dog behavior, I might recommend The Other End of the Leash by Patricia B. McConnell. What that actually talks about is your behavior and the signals that you accidentally give to your dogs that you don't realize you're doing. So it can help you learn to be conscious of your body language so that when you're communicating with a dog, they know exactly what you're doing and you know exactly what kind of things you're telling them. I think that's invaluable. So that's when I recommend The Other End of the Leash by Patricia B. McConnell. And zoos have put together a very useful tool on Telegram. You can go to https colon slash slash t dot me slash canine body language. That's all one uh, word. All one word, capital the first letter of each word. HTTPS colon slash slash t dot me slash canine body language. And that is a picture guide to canine body language. Can't hurt to take a look at that as well. I don't have anything offhand for other animals, but it really sounds like you're interested in canines. So that's where I would start. Yeah. I hope that helps you out a bit, Nodding Novice. I'm glad our show has resonated with you. Here's one from Stavros Milos on the subject of Zooey music. Mr. Milos writes... Hi, ZooTT crew, fan of the show. I'm amazed by how much content you put out. It is very comforting to listen to. I wondered about something fun for a future show, Zooey songs. But I don't know if you might run into copyright problems if you play any on air. They can be songs blatantly Zooey, funny, or parodies of actual songs like Dirty Deeds Done with the Sheep or Rodney Rude, <laughs> The Well-Hung Plowboy. Suggestively or ambiguously Zooey songs slash nice love songs about animals or accidentally Zooey songs. Also some songs that has the word you in it. You can substitute for you, spelled E-W-E, or have misheard lyrics. I'm sure you can come up with some or ask the audience. Maybe listeners could send in any of their own material as well. All the best, Mr. Milos. Oh, and why stop there? What about Zooey films, Zooey things and commercials, on TV programs, in the news? So many possibilities. Bye. <laughs> okay, so I want to answer this question for you. So when we were creating this podcast, we really looked into a lot of what podcast services were expecting of us. And there are definitely copyright issues when it comes to music, even if you're not advertising or making money off the podcast. If you use that kind of music, your shit gets pulled from podcast directories because you don't have the right to use it. So we really wanted to do everything by the book because, hello, we're a zoo podcast. We didn't want any reason to be removed from these services. So we always use royalty-free music. We always were very careful about the kinds of content we put on. In fact, we also did not say the name of a specific streaming service because it was against their TOS and we made a kind of joke about it at the beginning of the show. So yeah, we, we tried to walk the line pretty carefully. We actually kind of toe the line a little bit in some of the parodies that we do. That kind of stuff is really difficult to do on a podcast and still be within legal bounds. I think it's a cool idea though. And it's something we actually thought about. It's something I know Canis Gnosis was talking about doing for their show when they were planning to do something but that's something you run into a lot of problems with one other thing that we did kind of a long time ago in the same vein as that where we didn't have to host it or deal with copyright issues was we made an open source collaborative spotify playlist called zoo tunes and oh. If you look up Zoo Stories, all one word, Z-O-O-S-T-O-R-I-E-S, -O -O -E on Spotify, you'll see a Zoo playlist. And if you have other tunes that you would like to add, feel free to send an email to zoostories at protonmail.com. But right now we have 14 musical selections 
and we don't host them. So we're not going to get dinged for copyright issues. They're on Spotify. So feel free to give the Zoo Tunes playlist a listen on Spotify under Zoo Stories. That's fucking cool. I didn't even know about that. It's maybe a little cool. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> maybe a little. Another thing you mentioned talking about commercials and TV programs and the news and things like that. We did create our secret zoo segment to highlight zooey figures in pop culture. We also needed to be careful that anyone who was real is from history. We don't want to actually out any zoos by accident. But that's something we really did try to latch on to was shared cultural, you know, zooey figures. So, yeah, that's right on the money for what we wanted to do. Thanks for your ideas, Mr. Milos. We appreciate you writing it. Here's a really long one from our friend Cattail, who is trying to decide between monogamy and bringing another cat into his life. Cattail writes, Dear Zooey. <laughs> it's too long for a Zooey segment. <laughs> I've been thinking lately about my partner, an energetic and loving middle-aged cat, and whether he and I would benefit from a third feline in our little family. I'm writing you to ask, what do I need to consider before opening up a monogamous relationship to a second animal? How do I know if it's the right thing, both for myself and my cat? I'm exclusively zoo, primarily interested in cats and dogs, but all my deep committed relationships have been with cats. I've had this with a few cats over the years, but never with more than one at the same time. In other words, I've always been monogamous. I admit I've had occasional experiences outside of my main relationships, but never long-term or deeply romantic in the way that I am with my feline lovers. And I certainly wouldn't hold any animal to the standards of a human construct like monogamy, but for myself, the idea of monogamy has generally felt right. There's a comfort in knowing that I only have one top priority, one romantic relationship into which I can invest all my love and passion. The idea of balancing multiple such relationships has always sounded exhausting to me, but lately I've been reconsidering this approach to romance. Monogamy may simplify things, but I'm beginning to wonder if I have room in my heart for another partner after all. I've tried to imagine what it would be like to have another cat in our life. Sometimes it feels like it's a wonderful idea, but other times, I can't help but appreciate the simplicity of our relationship as it currently stands. My needs aside, I wonder if my cat would be happier with another feline to share the house. I feel guilty leaving him alone when I go to work. He often expresses to me his boredom or loneliness when I finally come home, and I feel like I can never quite make it up to him with the few hours I have between chores and bedtime. He also has a passion for play and exercise, and I have a hard time meeting his needs. Another playmate might be just the thing to enrich both of our lives. Overall, I'm just looking for a way to give him a more full life. This is where I'd appreciate some guidance. I consider taking an animal into your home to be a sort of sacred promise. You don't take an animal in unless you are dedicated to ensuring they are taken care of and loved for the rest of their life. I can't, in good conscience, adopt another cat without being certain that I'll be able to give them the love and the place in our home that they deserve. So one of my concerns is about managing another close relationship. Whether that relationship turns out to be romantic or simply a platonic friendship, I worry the second relationship will stretch me thinner than I'm comfortable with. I don't want my current lover or a new family member to suffer from a lack on my part. How can I be sure whether or not I'll be able to give both animals every bit of the affection and daily care that they deserve? It seems like the only way to know would be to adopt a cat and hope that things work out but I don't want to make such a promise when I might not be ready to keep it. My other concern is how my current cat would feel. How can I be sure that he would welcome another animal into the house? I don't want him to feel jealous or that his space has been invaded. How do I gauge his openness to the idea? The only thing I have to go on is a few bad experiences he's had with other male cats. My cat has a territorial streak typical of males of his species, so adopting another male is probably off the table. However, I don't have any direct knowledge about how he'd react to a female in our home. It seems simplistic to just assume his reaction to a female would be more positive, but it might improve the odds of a favorable outcome. What can I do to understand his feelings about this? And just to get practicalities out of the way, my man isn't intact. So surprise kittens isn't part of my concern here. I'd also appreciate hearing how you and the others at Zooier Than Now feel about monogamous, versus polyamorous approaches to Zooey relationships. 
Having only had experience with monogamy, I feel a bit out of my depth in considering alternatives. Any insight or perspective you can provide would be helpful. Many thanks, Cattail. All right, so here's the thing. You can't be sure. Right. There's, there's not much you can do to understand your cat's feelings with introducing the other cat until you introduce another cat. That's just how it is. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do? Have a discussion with them in advance? Like, that's <laughs> that's, not, that's not the cat way. You're going to have to just try it and do your best. Everyone just says to do their best and, and then take it from there. You can't predict every possible outcome. Just do your best, man. Right. And here's the thing. Like you said, it could mean your cat has someone to play with while you're not there. Or it could be a source of conflict. Or it might be hard at the beginning... But over time, they actually form a relationship and bond. It's difficult to say. Cats are people, and they have their own feelings about different things. A cat who is nine years old, having a new cat come in and and be around, might be a bit of a culture shock. It might help if the other cat is younger. So that could be a thing. Also, could not help but remember a story that Love Cat told about having to travel across country with Canis with their two dogs Mm. and how their dogs just could not get along, but they had to share this back seat for hours. (laughs) Like, there was no way around it. There was nothing else that could be done. Yeah, I met them on that trip. That was a tiny cart. Oh, my God. (laughs) With a lot of dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Like, they had to share this space. There was no way around it. Right. So he gave them CBD to calm them down, and they were able to just chill in each other's presence and get used to each other. And they've never had problems where they couldn't get along again. Like, whatever it was about that experience, they figured it out and were like, yeah, I'm cool with you. So I don't honestly know if they make CBD for cats, but there's always the friendly bonding between two cats and a bag of catnip. I imagine that might (laughs) smooth things over for the first introduction. It's worth a try, I suppose. The other big variable for me here is the personality of the other cat. Yeah, that's a thing. Right. You could end up with a really high strung, aggressive other cat that's going to be a challenge for any other pairing of any other human or animal. Or you could have one of those unflappable bookstore cats that's, (laughs) you know, cat atonic kind of. And and they just can't be bothered. So if you get one of those, then I don't know if that would satisfy the companionship needs that you're imagining for your current feline companion, but also probably not much of a a big reaction. One thing that you could do is foster a cat through your local animal shelter. And that's what typically happens is the animal shelters fill to capacity And they just don't have room for additional animals and they're going to start euthanizing them. So then they rely on foster homes. And if things don't work out, then the animal goes to an adoptive family, ideally. And if they do work out, then you're the adoptive family. So either way, you're providing an animal at least a temporary home so that they don't lose their life. And at best, uh, maybe that's the perfect match for you and your current companion. Yeah. Now, the other side of this, which is the personal side, is a little harder to really pin down. My experience with living with two cats is that I never really had any issues playing with one or the other because they usually weren't interested in my intention at the same time. There were a couple of times where they would both be there and I could sit down and pet them both. It wasn't a problem, but I noticed that the relationship you describe with your cat may be a lot less casual, but in general... It's hard for me as someone who hasn't been around cats in a long time and certainly did not form a romantic relationship with those cats to understand how that's going to affect your ability to give them your attention. Because already you feel like you don't have enough time. But on the other hand, if they get along and they're playing together while you're gone or sleeping together, just being around each other, and some of those companionship needs are fulfilled, you might find you actually have enough time because the other cat is not lonely anymore. So it's really hard. It's a toss up. And I don't think we're going to be able to tell you which way to go here. Yeah, it Um, it could be cool. Maybe it's worth a try, but you really won't know until you uh, try it. Right. One last thing, monogamy versus polygamy. I'm not even monogamous in human relationships, so it doesn't work for me. Being monogamous just doesn't work. Can't do it. I've tried it. 
it's a sticky situation for me, so I don't do that with my Zooey relationships either. There's nothing wrong with monogamy, however, so if that's what you're comfortable with, it's a perfectly valid way to express relationships and things like that. What do you feel like? Well, I'm poly with humans and generally pretty monogamous with animals, at least in terms of like serious, deep, romantic attraction, but I only get to vote for me. So I would just say general advice for anybody in any kind of relationship is listen to your conscience very carefully and follow it wherever it leads. Right. I know in human polyamorous relationships, the kind of questions that I would be asking are, am I going to get jealous if the other person, for instance, and this is the human side of things, am I going to get jealous if the other person has sex with another person? Am I going to get jealous if they spend time with another person who's in a polyamorous relationship with us? Can I handle that? Or am I going to be able to balance these two people in my life and make sure that none of them feel like they are not being given the attention. And it sounds like you're already asking yourself those questions. It's really easy to do that with human relationships. I feel it might be a little harder to ask with feline relationships only because I don't have experience with being in those kinds of relationships with felines. Right. And I think you might be trying to apply a human pattern of polyamory or monogamy onto a species that is the very definition of heteropaternal superfecundity, which if you score that as a Scrabble <laughs> word, then you, you could just flip the table at that point. You've won <laughs> hetero, heteropaternal, meaning that one litter of kittens has multiple different fathers and superfecundity means extremely fertile. So this is a defining characteristic of cats. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I wouldn't worry about your cat getting jealous. That's that's not the feline way. So I think in general, both are valid. Uh, you might think about how those terms may or may not apply to this relationship, whether or not you really need to think about them. I think they're really for yourself and how you relate to those relationships. <laughs> Hopefully that discussion helps in some way. So thank you for writing in Cattail. And I'm sorry it took so long to respond. Our last email comes from the somebodies who write in about disabled zoos. The somebodies write, Hello, I'm pretty new to listening and have taken great comfort in learning about zooey life from experienced people who help me feel normal and not dirty for who I love. But I notice a trend in the larger community that's a bit distressing. There's not a lot of talk about disabled zoos and how we're able or unable to interact with our partners compared to able-bodied zoos. I don't have a partner yet, but when listening to and reading others' experiences, I have a lot of worry I won't be able to provide for my future partner due to mobility and mental health issues. It's hard to relate to able-bodied people especially, as there are plenty of neurodivergent and mentally ill people in the community. Being unable to go out as much as others, in the case of systems like us, although only I'm writing in, those who use plural as a term or not, other system members not being zoos and potentially having issues with the relationship, chronic pain and fatigue that make it difficult to make sure companions of any species get the attention and overall engagement they need and deserve. It's an intersection that I'd really like to see discussed because it's scary not knowing if I'd be able to provide for my future partner because of my disabilities. I know there's others like me out there that probably feel the same way. I just also hope that there are other disabled zoos that already have partners that know more than I do, so I can learn from them and not hurt any non-human in the future. They deserve the world and beyond. So first off, just a disclaimer, if I say something ableist by accident, feel free to just let me know. I'm certainly not trying to, so that's the caveat. First of all, I think this would make a great topic. This is exactly the kind of topic that we would want to do in the future, so I'm pretty sure we're probably going to do it. I did speak with a plural zoo for some perspective on the idea of having someone inside your head who's not a zoo. Uh, apparently that can be very intense. Their advice was basically to, let's say you were two different people in two separate bodies, how would you talk to them about your relationship if you had to live with them and help them understand where you're coming from? 
They said that this is the best way to really handle it as if you're talking to another person who is reasonable. If they're vehemently anti-zoo, well, that's an interesting situation. I don't want to be the person to give you advice on that because I do not have experience with it. But I think there really is a valid concern one might have for not being able to give the care an animal deserves when you're dealing with chronic pain or any sort of disability. But I would want to talk with people who live those kinds of experiences rather than try to speak about it on my own. Yes. Okay, so I have a little bit of insight to share on this, maybe. Ooh. Having known a lot of zoos, some of whom are disabled. There's one in particular who is completely legally blind and is in a relationship with his seeing eye dog. Makes sense. Yeah. There's another I knew who was dying of hepatitis and oh. had a young pony right. that outlived him. So he made arrangements for her care after his death. But this doesn't even need to be necessarily a conversation about disabled zoos distinct from a conversation we would have about any zoos with any animals and particularly those with disparate lifespans. For instance, for a small breed dog, they might live upwards of 20 years. For a large breed dog like a Great Dane, maybe closer to seven years. So if you're likely to live less than the likely lifespan of your animal, have you made arrangements for their care after your death? That's something important to consider. Well, I think yeah. a part of the issue that they're having here is like, can I even bring someone into my life, period? Right. And, you know, I've even seen like elderly zoos who feel like physically they can't keep up with a very active large breed dog. Mm -hmm. So they might foster a dog knowing that it's a temporary arrangement and they're not permanently responsible for this dog's entire life or they get a smaller companion animal and their relationship is not sexual or at least in the same way but also they've matched their physical ability to care for this animal with the animal's needs right you know like how hard is it to care for a guinea pig versus a horse <laughs> right? And I, yeah. I don't mean that facetiously at all. Animals enrich our lives in so many ways that don't have to do with physical sexual compatibility. But mm -hmm. if we're looking realistically about what your animal companion needs and what realistically you can provide, I think that's a worthwhile evaluation. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Sure. All right. Well, like I said, that's definitely a topic that we will absolutely touch on in the future. If you are a disabled zoo, mentally or physically, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we would love to have you on the show and really talk to you about your experiences as a zoo. I think that'd be great. Yes. Thanks to the Somebodies for the fantastic topic suggestion. We appreciate the letter. That wraps it up for emails this episode. We have a few others we haven't responded to yet, and I've got a backlog of emails to compose, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Rest assured, we've read all your emails. Once I have time to sit down and work the task of going through remaining emails, I'll be following up with everyone. Up next, it's Ask Zooey. Stay tuned. And we're back. Thanks for tuning in once again to Ask Zooey, loyal listeners. As always, I'm Zooey, your trusted guide to cross-species romance. And I'm Toggle. And I'm just here because there's no one else to fill this spot. You'll always be one of my favorite co-hosts, Toggle. Have you ever had a co-host you didn't like? Not yet. But everyone brings their own unique flavor to the show. It's not easy being delicious. And don't I know it. Folks, if you've got a cross-species relationship question you've been dying to ask, don't wait. Pick up that phone right now and ask your operator to connect you to Zooey's dedicated hotline for inner species loving. Our tape machine is standing by to record your tawdriest quandaries and your sincerest concerns. Whether you bark, bray, or babble, we've got you covered. You can also simply email us like normal. That works too. Today's letter comes from Studley Dudley in Jumping Branch, West Virginia. Dudley writes, Dear Zooey, who knew retirement could be so weird? Well, okay, I admit it. For the most part, it isn't. It's actually pretty great. I'm treated like royalty. The humans all seem to love me, and I barely have to do any work at all. I guess it makes sense, given my dashing good looks and excellent manners. 
being kept apart from most of the rest of the horses still stinks. But I'm used to it at this point. And trust me, I get why. The poor mares would be all over me otherwise. I wouldn't get a wink of sleep. So yeah, I'm kind of a big deal. I'm the only stallion on the farm, the star of a little breeding program up here in the hills. At least, I used to be. It wasn't so long ago that the two-leggers would bring me mares from all over. Little mares, big mares, palominos and pasofinos, even a jenny once. If variety is the spice of life, I lived life well seasoned. But eventually, I got older, and all that crazy sex slowed down a lot. You can only live life in the fast lane for so long, I guess. But I can't help what I am. And what I am is not a fan of the bachelor herd life. Anyway, it was then that things got a little bit strange. You see, I used to hate sheath cleaning. I was grateful for it, to be sure. Being born with hooves makes it hard to keep things tidy. The problem was that my old trainer at the barn wasn't very good at it. She was a little harsh. The Geldings didn't really love it either. And that's saying something considering their... How should I say it? Relative lack of real estate to manage. But then the trainer left and a new one showed up. To make a long story short, she is a magic woman with magic hands. The Geldings don't get it, but I sure as heck do. They wouldn't appreciate a quality massage if it bit them in the rump. So, the last time she worked me over, I got a little excited. I may or may not have started belly slapping a little. <laughs> Sadly, that seemed to kind of turn her off. She managed to finish the job, but I don't think she was terribly happy. I felt bad afterwards, I couldn't help it. Now, I'm not opposed to a little interspecies fun, but I get the impression that she definitely is. I don't want my relationship with this human to go sour. At the end of the day, I wonder how much I'd need to contain myself. Have I crossed a line? It can be difficult walking the line between business and pleasure when that business feels oh so good. Indeed. Last time I got a prostate exam. Ooh. Let's just say, I know the power of magical hands firsthand. And I've really got to hand it to my proctologist. Suffice it to say, getting excited when someone's fondling your sheath is expected. And professionals know this. There's nothing embarrassing or untoward about dropping or becoming erect when the trainer is giving you a thorough cleaning. In fact, most trainers prefer it because it makes it easier to get those hard to reach places. A stallion like you probably sports quite a lot of sheath. So showing your appreciation for a trainer's fine technique can certainly be a good thing, which helps them get the job done with less hassle. However, belly slapping can definitely create a distraction that's quite off-putting for trainers who want to maintain a professional distance. It also makes their job slightly more difficult, so it's far less appreciated than a simple erection. If she's sending you the signals that she's not interested, then it's a good idea to save the belly slapping for afterwards as a reward to yourself for a cleaning well done. It's good to hear this new trainer knows what they're doing when handling your most prized possession, Studley. Folks, you can't forget that a stallion's member is one of the most sensitive parts of their bodies. Handle it with care. If you have the privilege of helping keep a stallion or a gelding clean and in good health, remember these tips to make sure you leave him belly slap happy. Don't use cold water. Warm water is not only more pleasant, but it tends to clean more effectively. And remember, there is some bacteria that's healthy, so be mindful of using harsh soaps and antibacterial cleansers. Be mindful of any skin irritations, such as rashes or wounds, and do your best not to exacerbate any issues. Gloves are highly recommended, but also remember to keep those nails trimmed. No one likes it when a two-legger claws up their junk. And of course, clean that sheath regularly. Not too often, because that could cause issues too, but in general, the longer your big guy goes without a cleansing, the more likely his tool is to get irritated, and the more likely all that gunk builds up into a painful bean. If you let it go for too long, that bean can get really big, and sometimes big enough to make it difficult to urinate. And that leads to a whole host of other issues. That's no fun for anyone to have to deal with. That's right. So keep those sheaths clean and bean-free. If you do it right, you just might give them the happy ending they deserve. And they'll thank you for it. You'll certainly do right by Dudley. Thanks for writing in, you old stud. You sure sound like a horse's horse. And I'm glad to hear retirement is treating you well. Just remember to save the belly slapping for later. And that's our show, dear listeners. 
Thanks so much for tuning in. We look forward to answering all your Zooey relationship questions next season. Keep those submissions coming. We'll see you next time on Ask Zooey. Same zoo time, same zoo channel. show dear listeners thanks for sticking with us for three full years of zoo positivity we hope you've enjoyed the ride as much as we have and we look forward to seeing you next season as always you can find us online at zoo.wtf you can also subscribe to the show by pointing your favorite podcast client at rss.zoo.wtf we put out an episode every full moon and season four starts on march 18th Finally, don't forget to drop us a line at mail at zoo.wtf. Good night, everybody. You set me free. You make me feel alive. I'm not me when you're not by my side. If you start her or boy.